Good morning. This is Perry Conger again, poultry health specialist with the USDA, APHIS Veterinary Services. Previously, I discussed the highly pathogenic avian influenza and how devastating it can be to individual poultry flocks and the poultry flock, poultry industry in general. During this session, I'm going to discuss exotic Newcastle disease, which believe it or not, is a much more severe disease than even highly pathogenic avian influenza. So if we look at Newcastle disease, it's a family paramyxoviridae. There are nine different serotypes, avian influenza, avian paramyxovirus serotypes one through nine, but only one causes exotic Newcastle disease, which is referred to as APMF serotype one. There are three different pathogenic strains, lentogenic, mesogenic, and velogenic. Uh, under velogenic, there is neurotrophic and visotrophic, and also it is also known as virulent Newcastle disease or exotic Newcastle disease. So if we look at the, those three Pathotypes, we have lentogenic, mesogenic, and velogenic. Lentogenic is uh, a lo very low pathogenicity. With that, uh, we even have this particular strain of Newcastle disease is relatively common in backyard poultry producers in many states, and there is a vaccine available for this particular, particular disease which is very effective. It causes mild respiratory signs, decreased egg production, and weight loss, but very, very negative, low mortality. Mesogenic is intermediate in terms of pathogenicity. It, we have occasional neurological signs involved with, with this infection, and a low mortality, but Velogenic is of high, highly uh, mortal, uh, high mortality. The most recent outbreak was in 2018 and, and 20 in the United States. It occurred primarily in Southern California, but also in, there was one flock in Nevada and one flock in Utah that were affected. This velogenic. Newcastle disease or virulent Newcastle disease is the most severe poultry disease in the world due to the high mortality and how uh, prevalent it is throughout the world. It can cause death without any clinical signs at all, between 95 and 100 percent mortality. The problem with this is countries that do not have uh, virulent Newcastle disease. Do, do not want to take a chance on importing bird, exposed birds, so it shuts down trades. The countries will place an embargo on poultry and poultry products out of areas or countries affected by, with virulent Newcastle disease. So if we look at the clinical signs, there's a severe drop in egg production, severe mortality, and Death loss occurs for seven to 10 days. And the surviving birds may have permanent neurological or reproductive damage. Some of the clinical signs are very similar, if not identical, to those, those clinical signs of highly pathogenic avian influenza. Upper respiratory signs are very prominent. Swollen sinuses and orbits of nasal and ocular discharge, discoloration of wattles and combs, such like that. You know, like I said, uh, one, of the, one of the key signs is green di greenish diarrhea for some reason, because Newcastle disease is a systemic disease, and affected birds will have a characteristic green, greenish diarrhea here, as illustrated right here, and it causes respiratory and neurological signs. The signs vary depending with the species affected, 
and the virulence of the particular that thing or bar strain. Once again, here's some neurological signs of torticollis, uh, ataxia, and upper respiratory signs are very prominent. It, with uh, Newcastle disease also has a neurological expression. It, in humans, it can cause a very severe conjunctivitis, as you can see right here. It is not fatal in humans, but it, it's very uncomfortable in terms of the upper respiratory and severe conjunctivitis that it causes. In terms of morbidity and mortality, morbidity can be up to 100%, mortality 90 to 100%. It varies greatly depending on the virulence and the strain, the avian species and susceptibility of the host, environmental conditions, and vaccination history. Some species show no, few or no signs. In monitor waterfowl, they're more or less a carrier, very, neg very uh, negligible clinical signs in waterfowl. A carrier state may exist. Postmortem signs, no, edema in the head and neck. Throughout the body, there are petechial and echemonic hemorrhages, particularly the tracheal mucosa, the proventriculus, which is part of the digestive tract, and, and digestive tract and intestinal mucosa. Virulent Newcastle disease may enter the USA or any area via the following routes. We say the USA because it, uh, Newcastle disease is not anywhere close to endemic. Newcastle disease in the United States is a foreign animal disease. So it can, the one possible route, uh, route of entry is smuggled fighting cocks or imported exposed fighting cocks from an endemic area. In Mexico, there are areas of Mexico that are prominent with new, uh, virulent Newcastle disease. So importing fighting cocks out of that area could bring in the infection. Exposed citizen birds, citizens are those of the parrot family. They, they can serve as a carrier without negligible clinical signs or exposed monitor waterfowl, in particular double-crested cormorants and northern pintail dabbling ducks. And this has occurred or identified among those in the Pacific Flyway. The sources of the virulent Newcastle disease virus are respiratory secretions or discharges and fecal material from infected birds all parts of an infected carcass. The virus is shed during the incubation period, during clinical stages, and for a limited time during convalescence. And there are various numbers of types of uh, reservoir holes that it can occur. Cormorants, pigeons, doves, and citizen birds can serve as reservoirs. Some citizen birds have been demonstrated to shed Newcastle disease virus intermittently for over a year after infection. So transmission routes, you know, direct or indirect contact with the, the, the virus with via feces or respiratory secretions, indirect contact through contaminated fomites, contaminated or inactivated vaccines, migratory birds, like I said before, particularly double-crested cormorants or northern pintail dabbling ducks, also da uh, uh, doves, feral pigeons, or citizens can serve as reservoirs. If we look at the transmission routes identical to that as we discussed with uh, highly pathogenic avian influenza, the, the, the disease is introduced into a flock and then the virus is spread from one area or flock to another through contaminated equipment, service personnel, vehicles, and whatnot. So very similar to that uh, as with we learned with highly pathogenic avian influenza. The susceptible species, chickens are very highly susceptible. Game birds, particularly pheasants, 
partridges, and quail, and guinea fowl, and parrots are, are varying susceptibility. Some of them uh, show very uh, negligible clinical signs. Same way with wild birds and waterfowl. In terms of laboratory diagnosis, no. The, very similar to those, the serologic, the assays, the uh, diagnostic assays that we discussed with highly pathogenic egg and influenza, hemagglutinin, in, uh, hemagglutinin inhibition test, a serological assay, the ELISA test, another serological assay, or the PCR, preliminary chain reaction on swab samples, and virus isolation is the gold standard for identifying and uh, typing that particular virus at NBSL, the reference laboratory. The history of virulent Newcastle disease in 1898, pro probably exotic Newcastle disease, wiped out or uh, eradicated or killed most domestic fowl, fowl, fowl or poultry in northwestern Scotland. In 1926, exact Newcastle disease was first identified in Java and in Indonesia in 1927 in Thai in England. In terms of the United States, the first case, U.S. case, occurred in partridges and pheasants that were imported from Hong Kong. Our first outbreak was in Southern California from 1971 to 1974, we had 13, over 1,300 infected and exposed flocks. 12 million birds were either succumbed to the disease or had, were depopulated. There were 50, the cost to the USDA was $56 million. The imported, the Probable source was an imported or smuggled in exposed parrot. Then in 2002, 2003, in Southern California, same area, same geographical area, same demographics involved, we had another incursion where four million birds were involved. The cost of eradication was significant over $209 million in 2011 dollars. Trade restrictions result, resulted from that infection. And the most probable, most likely source of this infection was an imported or smuggled uh, fighting cock across the border from Tijuana, through Tijuana into Southern California. That's why it started there. This, the stippled area here shows the infected area. In Southern California, it spread into Southern Nevada there and to Western Arizona. And they took, allegedly, they took exposed birds to a, a poultry show in the Las Vegas area. And that's how it spread the vehicle of transmission into Nevada and it spread into western Arizona through other possible routes. So simultaneously in April of 2003, BND was also disclosed in Texas. That's when I was uh, associated with the Texas Animal Commission, so I was on site there. The problem was in this particular case, once again, a backyard exhibition or, or uh, fighting cock producer. He witnessed a spike in mortality in that case, and he contacted the export veterinarian from the El Paso port, and the export veterinarian went out to examine his birds, and that veterinarian readily recognized the potential, and that veterinarian personally couriered those samples to National Veterinary Services Laboratory for diagnosis. So. We, we had a slush fund in, in Texas where we could provide indemnity for affected flocks before 
on suspicion of an infection, and we had those birds euthanized and buried before that virus was identified at NBSL. And that's key to know. And we identified that particular uh, genotype came out of Chihuahua, Mexico, as opposed to the Southern California strain. So it was a completely different incursion, not associated, not epidemiologically related to the Southern uh, California strain or outbreak. So, so as I said, the, they were samples were couriered to the NBSL, flock depopulated before virus virus isolation at NBSL, and we tested about 2,000 backyard flocks in the El Paso area, and in, there was one uh, lane flock in just across the border in New Mexico. So we tested all of those flocks and demonstrated that there was no spread of infection. The key element here is we had those birds, exposed birds, infected birds, uh, euthanized and buried before they had the chance to spread to other flocks in the area. And that's a key element there. Rapid response to a disease incursion is the key to controlling spread of infection. And the quarantine was released. In 2018, same area, Southern California, Los Angeles County, an accredited veterinarian, birds were brought to his clinic and he collected diagnostic samples. He, he was very suspicious sent them to the laboratory in, in uh, California, and California relayed, uh, forwarded those samples to NBSL to confirm exotic Newcastle disease. So the, the problem was is we were behind, and we didn't know there was infection in that area. So before it was over, we had spread of infection. We had the primary area here in Southern California, but we had one flock up here in Alameda County up here that was infected. Birds were transported up there. They were sick. So it, that was a rehab center for birds. So that's how that flock became, or a small unit became infected. And also exposed birds were uh, transported one one group to Utah County in Utah. Once once again, a backyard flock, exposed birds, and then to a backyard flock in northwestern Arizona. So once again, bird exposed birds broke quarantine and transported to the, those three outlying areas, and that's the reason for the spread of infection. So the di different production types that were infected during that outbreak. There were 473 backyard fighting cock, cocks, uh, flocks were infected, plus a, a variety of commercial tur turkey, commercial flocks, plus even a retail feed store, the live bird markets, and even a veterinary clinic and a, and a body research facility was infected. So, a wide variety of flocks for a total of 495 affected premises during that particular outbreak. Once again, emphasizing same area, same geographical area, beginning in 1971, that first outbreak, then the 2002-2003 outbreak, same geographical area, same demographic, primarily backyard flocks, fighting roosters. So here we see the epidemiological uh, curve. We see how it progressed over time. Then we went through a period here where we thought it was over, but it wasn't. We had another minor outbreak later on in you know, April and May of 2020 here, but finally we cleaned it up and the quarantine was released. So. How did the surveillance program that was employed to demonstrate that we didn't have infection in that particular outbreak? We tested to identify new cases. Commercial flocks were tested twice weekly. Independent flocks were dependent 
or tested twice weekly. Backyard flocks were once again tested frequently. The live bird markets were tested monthly with uh, downtime every 120 days. And we also did sick bird calls, collecting samples to demonstrate we didn't have infection. So the key, biosecurity. If we look at this, the back, typical backyard flock that were primarily infected, there's no way to employ adequate biosecurity measures. There's no way. And here's another typical backyard flock. No way biosecurity measures could be employed here. Same way. So this is a typical fighting rooster production facility with individual huts. There's no way for adequate biosecurity measures to be employed, but they must, the individual producers must be made aware of the risk of purchasing birds or importing birds from areas from that might be infected. So the virus elimination practices that were, since we could not disinfect those backyard flocks, we 120 day fallow period before they brought in new birds was involved. So, and they were checked to make sure they didn't bring in other birds. Some of those flocks in that particular outbreak, there were a cluster of those flocks that were reinfected, same outbreak. And some of the flocks from the 2002, 2003, reinfected. So see, uh, we could clean and disinfect commercial, non-commercial K layer facilities. And we also employed vector control, you know, CNB, flushing water lines, wildlife services without out there, you know, to help depopulate those backyard flocks. So here's an example of some of the challenges associated with the 2018 to 2020 outbreak. We had only one infected flock in Ventura County disclosed. This is over 80 miles from the nearest infected flock in Los Angeles County. This was disclosed on a sick bird call. There were two positives out of six samples. This facility was a rooster boarding facility that also had pigeons. This was a training camp for riot fighting roosters. There were 4,400 birds were depopulated. There were 57 owners involved that had to be indemnified. We tested all the adjacent flocks and made over 400 contacts around that flock. No spread of infection, but this illustrates the uh, how complicated this particular response was. This is just one example. So the, there's a potential reservoir in Southern California. In Southern California, when folks get tired of, of their parrots, they turn them loose. So we have a, a feral wild parrot population that has been developed, been developed in Southern California. In several cities in Southern California, T 10 of those species came from the jungles of Latin, Latin America. One came from India and in North Africa. But all these birds, or 90% of them, had been pets that were turned loose when people got tired of caring for them. So we have a potential reservoir here that we must be aware of. So if we look internationally, the incidence of BMD internationally, you no, know, it's found throughout the world, although currently it's been controlled in Canada, the United States, and, and some of the uh, other Western Hemisphere countries. It's endemic in parts of Africa, Asia, and S South America. So if we look, break that down, in according to OIE, who's the reporting agency, as of January 1st, 2020, Africa had 40, 
countries that were infected, only seven of African countries were not infected. That's how prevalent it is in Africa. Similar in Asia, 29 countries, Asian countries were infected, 14 didn't, were not infected, for 67% of the flocks were infected in Asia. Europe is not so bad, 34 countries are free of infection, eight still had, had exotic Newcastle disease. North America and Central America, five countries, if that's include, including Mexico, were infe are infected and continue to be infected for 42% of the countries in North and Central America. South America, nine countries demonstrate that they don't have infection, three are, are still infected. Oceania, which is Austria, New Zealand, that area, no infection. So if we look at worldwide, how prevalent, prevalent it is, out of 161 reporting countries, 85 or 53% of them are infected with exotic Newcastle disease. That demonstrates how prevalent, prevalent it is. In conclusion, the risk of incursion of virulent Newcastle disease is very, very high in every part of the world due to its high prevalence of potential for reservoirs in all areas of the world. The primary protective measure against virulent Newcastle disease and all infectious diseases is the implementation and maintenance of stringent biosecurity measures on every facility, whether it be commercial, non-commercial, or backyard flock. That biosecurity is the most economical method to protect one's flock or one's industry compared to all other, other uh, modes of protection that includes vaccination and whatnot. So I cannot overemphasize the importance of biosecurity. Thank you for your attention. And I wish you the best of luck in your individual poultry production, whether it be commercial or backyard.